So today I'm just going to brush through the elements of music and I'm going to start to talk about the beginning of sci-fi and motion pictures and stuff like that. All right. So first of all, sound is vibration as it's perceived by your ears. And the faster the vibration, the higher the pitch that is created. Right? So if I go, oh, that's a really fast vibration. And if I go, oh, that's a lower, slower vibration. Right? The volume of a sound wave has to do with the amplitude of it. And so it has a very it's fast, right? intense amplitude, creates a louder sound and a more relaxed amplitude creates a softer sound. So those are like basic physics. Have you ever seen like a sine wave? Yeah. Okay, the peaks and troughs, that's the amplitude, the distance from the peak to the trough. The, the um, frequency, like you were talking about, the speed. Is how close the bands are together. So if I do uh, If I do this, that is a lower pitch than this, right? And in music in particular, um, like say this frequency is 440, for lack of anything, my favorite example, 440 vibrations per second. So you get 440 humps in every second, that's how fast they move. That is a specific pitch. That's this. Have you ever seen a tuning fork? Traditionally, a tuning fork tunes to A. They have different sizes now and all that kind of stuff. But traditionally, a tuning fork tunes to A, and that's 440 vibrations per second to creates that pitch. Then, if I want to be, if I double that, and so this is 440, if I do 880 vibrations per second, that's twice as much, so I'm going to do that and then the humps line up every two. And that's 880 vibrations per second. That creates the same pitch, which I call A, but one octave higher. So they sound the same, sort of, right? It sounds like the same note, but one's high and one's low. And then 220 vibrations per second, right, is half again the value, so it would be So this would be 220. And so that is how music is kind of set up. So it was a bunch of scientists initially that kind of came up with that. The mathematician scientists moments that pulled the whole music system together. So that A440 that I showed you sits right here. And it's always in between the top two group of three. That's also an A. That's also an A. That's also an A. So every you find that position on the A, that's an A. And then the next note up from A, the next white key up from A is B. And it's always again being placed in the same place. And so separated by octaves, that's where the frequency itself doubles, creating that same essential pitch. So for pitch, which is the high or lowness of sound, pitch uh, is determined by frequency, but it also has what we call harmonics, or like an overtone series. So even though I have my main frequency, 440 vibrations per second, if it's just like an electronic, that's pretty much all you're going to get. It doesn't have an overtone series to speak of. But the more resonance, it's another music term, it's the way the sound waves sort of bounce around and fill a space, the more resonance there is, the more um, overtones and harmonics are going to be created. So we have a harmonic series that's created by every frequency, when the harmonic series are secondary frequencies, which is why some notes sound good together and some pitches don't sound good together because they're Sound wave patterns of the harmonic series are fighting against each other instead of meshing because of the way they're created. And also in music, like certain things we use commonly, especially in Western music, which is when we say Western music, we're talking about the whole Western hemisphere, right? So all of North America, South America, and most of Europe. When we get into the Middle East and Asia and sort of, you know, North. East area, China, all that, is all uh, on a 
different tonal system. They use what's called the pentatonic scale, and you can tell by the name, it's a five note scale. And incidentally, this is the perfect, easiest example of a pentatonic scale is the black keys. And if I just take them, children's songs are based on a pentatonic scale that's easy for your ear to pick up. But in Western culture, we usually use what's called the diatonic scale, which are major scales. Major minor scale patterns in Western music. Asian music uses pentatonic, Asian Middle Eastern uses pentatonic system, which is five note scale. Our scale is actually a seven note scale. So what we do is we use the first seven letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then we start it over again because there's a lot more than seven notes on the piano and in our voices and on any musical instrument. So it just keeps repeating, it's the same cycle. And again, if I do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You can see that works, right? And now, okay. Um, so those are just some basics. Now we have different kinds of musical instruments. We have families of instruments. We have string instruments. So anything, um, anything where the sound is produced by a string. So violin, viola, cello, and an upright bass, right? A harp, also a string instrument. So that is created by plucking a harp or strumming a guitar, a string instrument. A ukulele, mandolin, all those are string instruments. Um, uh, regular like orchestral, violin, viola, cello, bass, the sound is created with a bow. The bow is a horse here that's stretched from end to end on a bow. <laughs> and you let it ride, it glides over the string, and it's the friction of the horse hair on the bow rubbing against the string that causes the string to vibrate. So the source of the sound is the vibration of the string. So that is called a string instrument. A woodwind instrument, they're called that because they used to be made of wood, like a clarinet is still made of wood, or an oboe is still made of wood. A flute now is usually made of metal, but it's considered a woodwind instrument because its early ancestors are always wood, right, or reed. Um, so those are wind instruments because the sound is made by pushing air through the instrument and that causes the air to vibrate inside, and that's how the sound is produced. So like a whistle, right? Like a, a, like a coach uses, there you go, good athletic reference. Um, that would also be an example of a, of a wind instrument, right? We also have brass instruments. Those are also wind instruments. They're just not woodwind, they're brass wind instruments. But woodwinds and brass instruments are all considered wind instruments because the sound is made. So trumpet, trombone, those are all brass instruments, but they're also wind instruments because that's how the sound is produced. Okay? Then we have percussion instruments. Anything where the sound is made by hitting or striking is a percussion instrument. So the source of the sound is this, the action of striking something, so drums. Any kind of a drum, any kind of a xylophone, anything that you hit is a percussion instrument. Clapping your hands, your hands are now percussion instruments. Stomping your feet, they're percussion instruments, right? But typically a drum is uh, what we think of when we think of a percussion instrument, and a drum is made with having some kind of a membrane across the top, and then it has a cavity underneath which helps to create resonance. And if, in order for music to sound beautiful, 
we want it to have as much resonance as possible. If I sing la 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 la, there is zero resonance there, and it doesn't sound very pretty. But la whoa, if I create big open space for the sound to bounce around it, you now have more resonance and you get a better sound. Right? So, like as a singer, that's what we try to train: is how do I get optimum resonance so my voice doesn't sound like I'm six years old, right? Um, so percussion instrument, you have a membrane across the top, and you vibrate the membrane by hitting it with mallets or with your fingers, and the vibration of the membrane creates sound waves, and then you have the belly of the drum, the sound waves are bouncing around, and that's where the tone gets produced, right? Um, there's all different kinds of those instruments, some which they use in sci-fi music. You guys maybe you've heard in like some old rock music like in the 70s, they used to use vibraphone a lot. Right? So that's a sound that we would kind of associate with like some of the science fiction music, right? Because it has a, a kind of a different quality of sound. Um, gongs, cymbals, the triangle, ding, all of those are percussion instruments. And then keyboard instruments have sort of a separate thing. So this is essentially a harp on lights. I took a harp and I flip it over. And a harp is a string instrument. And if I open that lid up, it's a harp. It's a big gold harp with strings. But the sound is not produced by plucking or bowing. Because the sound is produced with a lever mechanism. I hit a key, and the key is a lever that's attached to a hammer, and the hammer goes up and hits the strings. And that's how the sound is produced. So what kind of an instrument would we call a piano? Because the sound is produced by hitting the percussion. It's considered a percussion instrument. So if you uh, learn about a jazz band, the rhythm section is the drum and sometimes the bass, but the piano, the piano and the drum creates a rhythm section. And so we think of that as like percussion, and the piano keeps, like helps to keep the beat, like in a jazz band, right? So this is technically a percussion instrument. All right, anyway, um, a harpsichord is a string instrument, it's, you know, it goes ding, 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 and that's created and has, there are different versions of it, but um, usually you hit the key and it goes up and it has like a, kind of like a crochet hook, and it'll go up, and if this is a string that comes in and it catches on the string, and that's how it's vibrated, so it's like it's plucked, okay? Um, sometimes it uses pinchers, but anyway, um, so harpsichord, and then there's an organ, so organ, I've got a keyboard, so it's a keyboard instrument, but the sound in an organ is produced by blowing wind through the chimes, right? Those big, each of those great big long stacks is a chime. And when you blow wind through it, the wind vibrates and creates a sound. So that's actually a, a, like a woodwind <laughs> instrument, right? Because that's how the sound is produced. Another type of classification of instruments, so there's a membranophone, you hear the word membrane in there, that would apply to any kind of a drum that has a drum head on it, right? So membranophone, and then you also have aerophones, which are wind instruments, right? Because it uses A-E-R-O when I say aerophone. And then an idiophone means the sound is created from within. So like a rattle or a maraca, right? Like a gourd with the seeds and you shake it, that would be an idiophone, okay? So those are extra, extra things to think about. Now we also have what's called musical elements. And these are different things to listen for when you're listening to a piece of music. The most obvious that I just talked about is pitch, and pitch is just the high or lowness of sound. And then there's also rhythm, which is actually the duration of sound, right? So if I say, twinkle, twinkle, little star, that star note is longer than all the others, and that's what creates the rhythm pattern. And if I do, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, they all have a little different, some of them are short, some of them are a little longer, some of them are super short, and it's the duration of pitch that creates the rhythm pattern. So we've got pitch, and we've got rhythm, and tying in with each of those things are other um, elements. So pitch, usually we deal with melody, which is the main 
tune of a song, and that has to do with how the pitches are organized. And then after I create the melody, I can add harmony to it, which is another set of pitches, but a different set, which is designed to support the melody, not to detract your ear so I have two different melodies fighting. That's something completely different. That's something called counterpoint. But when I have a main melody and it's harmonized, that is just the way I've arranged pitches to support the main melody. Okay, So melody is another musical element. Harmony is a separate musical element, but they both have to do with pitch. Rhythm, there are different things uh, that make up rhythm. So basically, rhythm is just the duration of pitch, but if I do... Um, if, I, uh, if I'm doing a piece of music, I'm going to have, if it's, called, if it's what's called metered music, it means that it has a steady pulse, like your heart, right? This is your personal meter. <laughs> so I have this pulse, and that's the beat. And then when I group the beats... So I can kind of, it helps me sort of feel the music, it helps me keep track of where I am in the music. I group them, that det is determined by the meter. So if I do, I think for an example again, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder, the beat stays steady, but some notes are longer and some notes are shorter, right? Star is long, twinkle, are short, are just one beat each. Um, but the meter of that is usually one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. So if I were to write that song out, I would put a time signature at the front, which would tell whoever's performing it that I'm going to kind of group those beats in twos. Now the beat stays even, but it just has to do with the way you sort of internalize the beat. If I changed it and I put it in 3-4, it doesn't like fit. Like if I try to group it in three beats, because three, you feel one, two, three, one, two, three. So a song that is meant to be in groups of two or meant to be in groups of four, it doesn't fit if I use a 3-4 time signal. I would have to sort of tweak the rhythm patterns a little bit in order to make it fit. So meter is how we feel the pulse being grouped. And every single piece of music that's metered has a time signature at the front of it. So the beginning of a song, these are clef markings. That's a treble clef. That means it's for high instruments or high voices. So flutes, clarinets, trumpets, sopranos, altos, all women's voices read this staff, right? And then low voices, low instruments read this. If you play the piano, your left hand does the low stuff and your right hand does the right. But right after that is my fraction, and that's my time signature. The top of the time signature tells me how my beats are grouped. So both of these songs, it's grouped in four. So one, two, three, four, like Mary Had a Little Lamb. Mary had a little Little lamb, you can feel that. Little lamb, little lamb. You can't do that in three, you can't do it in two, it won't work. Um, the bottom number of the time signature gives me my note values. So in music, the longest kind of note that we have is just a circle, it's like a donut, and that's a whole note. And the bottom number of the time signature tells you how many beats you're going to give to a whole note. I'll just do that real quick. Whole note looks like that. If I attach a stem to it, the stem can go down, or the stem can go up, or I can have the note filled in. If it's a black note with a stem, that's a quarter, so this is whole, half, quarter, and then when I start adding what we call flags, that makes it an eighth note. If I add another flag, it makes it a sixteenth note. And the names of all of these are in relation to what they, how they are related to the whole note. So the whole note gets the whole value of the bottom of the time signature. A half note is worth half of that. A quarter note is worth a quarter of that. So an eighth note is one eighth of a whole note, and a sixteenth is one sixteenth of a whole note. So you just have to do the math. So on the piano keyboard, you got white keys. Those are just a letter name. 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G. The black keys um, create what we call a half step. So if I go from one white key to another white key, and there's a black key in between them, going from white key to white key, the white key in between is a whole step. If I go from the white key to the very, very next black key, that's a half step. And then from that same black key up to the very next white key is also a half step, which is why it's a whole step when, right? Um, and so when I have a scale of all half steps, that means I'm using every white key and every black key. <laughs> contemporary music or if you want something to sound wacky because usually there's nothing wacky about that there's nothing sci-fi sounding about that <laughs> but sci-fi music is going to use what's called the chromatic scale and the chords if they're just thirds they usually don't have what's called dissonance they're just sweet and sweetness and sound is called consonance they sound good together and if I do this that's one of the most dissonant intervals that there is. Right? Or this. It just makes your skin crawl, right? So that's called dissonance. And this sci-fi music is going to use a lot of dissonance because it wants people to feel on edge, right? When the alien pops into the room, you want them to go, Aah! and so they're going to have the music sound that way. So dissonance is intentionally used to create anxiety <laughs> to create, so make sure you don't listen to dissonance music, because the music you listen to will actually affect your mood and your like mental state. If you listen to sweet, nice, soothing music, you'll be in a nice, sweet, mellow mood. But if you listen to really like dissonant music, you'll feel angsty. I mean, it does work that way. So again, interval is a distance between two pitches, and we have, we have dissonance, and consonants. Those are important factors that you need to know. I should talk to you about uh, perfect intervals, which have uh, everything to do with keys. This interval from do to so is a fifth, right? One, two, three, four, five. And it's um, part of the harmonic series that I talked about with frequencies. So the fifth is what's called a perfect interval. So it's a perfect fifth. It's not just a fifth. It's a perfect fifth. And the remainder of that, if I go from the octave down, that is a fourth, right? One, two, three, four. And the fourth and the fifth make an eighth. <laughs> Only in music, right? And so if I go from do up to fa, one, two, three, four, that's a perfect fourth, which leaves the fifth is the balance, right? So because the fourth and the fifth create the middle of the scale, the fifth is important because that's part of the harmonic series that I talked about before, right? Um, the overtone series. And the, the inverse of it is the fourth. So there's the fifth. All of our keys are related by fifths. Um, back in the beginning, when they first started uh, writing music, singing music, it was mostly chant. And they would usually use, like, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. And then somebody else would sing chant, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Right? And they would do it. They would stay separated by a fifth. They were called parallel intervals, which would just move parallelly. It had to do with a lot of stuff, but the, the church had a lot of rules that you couldn't do too much, and you could only use one melody, and so then people, well, well then we'll use it at this pitch level, and we'll use it at this pitch level, and they'll stay parallel. And then the fourth. To me, I think fourth sounds kind of dissonant, but... this. It's the clashy one that I played for you before. That's the clashiest 
interval evolve. It's so special that they call it a tritone. It was called the devil's son. And people would like, get imprisoned or get their head chopped off if they composed music that contained a tritone. Once upon a time, it was considered the voice of the devil. And most music at the dawn of like composed music was church music. So if you put that in there, yeah. there's a problem with you. But this, no problem with this. Great, we love that. But not that. Um, so anyway, back to the fifth. If I start in the key, the key of A has three sharps. And if I go up a fifth from A, I'm going to end up on E. So E has four sharps, so forth and so on. So as I'm going up a fifth every time from key to key, I'm adding a sharp. If I go down a fifth, I end up going from C down to F. So the key of F has one flat in it. And if I go from F down a fifth, I end up on B flat, so it has two flats in it. And then if I go a fifth down from there, I end up on E flat, and so forth and so on, until we kind of come back around and go all the way around the clock. It's called the circle of fifths. If I write chords on a piece of music, they look like this. Remember I told you about stacking thirds? If I stack thirds, they look like snowmen, right? It's line, line, line or space, 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 you need that many. So a three note chord would be a triad, right? Four note chord is not a triad. It would be like this as a seventh chord, but we don't need to go into that right now. But um, that's what they look like. If I stack thirds, I get a chord or a triad, and it looks like a snowman. All right, we also have dynamics in music. Dynamics have to do with volume, so the loud and soft, and it's all Italian. So, you ready for a quick Italian lesson? The word for soft in Italian is piano, like just like this. This is called a piano because it's a forte piano or piano forte. It was the first musical keyboard instrument that could do both soft and loud. A harpsichord couldn't. A harpsichord is just ting, ting, ting. But I can pound on this sucker and make a lot of noise, or I can play really light and soft and frilly. Right? So it can do both forte, which is to play with force, which produces loud sound, or I can play piano, which is soft. So those are the two main words for dynamics. Soft is piano, loud is forte. And then I have a word which is mezzo, which is in the middle. Um, so lunchtime in Italy is mezzo. And so mezzo forte, is medium loud, and mezzo piano is medium soft. And then if I want it to be really loud, I have a special ending that I put on, um, and it's an ending that's used for not just musical things. So if I say, oh, you are very bello, or bella, right? And if I want to say, you're not just beautiful, but you're like really beautiful, I would say bellissima. So not just bella, but belliss, and it's the I-S-S that means like twice as much as normal. So in music, if I say forte, it means loud. But if I say fortissimo, it means really loud. And then if I add an extra is in there, it's fortissimo, and it's three times as loud. You can do that, you can just stack it up, right? Same way, piano, pianissimo, pianississimo, and so forth and so on. And the markings for those, Look like I'm not going to get up and write it up, but three P's is P N E S E C O. Two P's is P N E S E M O. One P is piano, and then you do the same thing with the F's. Okay, so those are the markings in music. Um, then the next thing that is super important musical element, probably the most important musical element when you guys are listening to these examples, is form. Uh, musical form has to do with the way patterns are repeated in the music. So, for instance, if I have a song and it's like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, that's just A, B form. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are, that would be the A phrase. Up above the world so high, that's different, right? So that's B. Like a diamond in the sky, that's just like the other B, so that's it. B, B. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, I wonder what you are. So that form for twinkle, twinkle, little star would be A, B, B, A. Make sense? 
it's the rhyme scheme. And so we have big chunks of music, and the scheme is the form of the music, okay? Um, and it has to do with how different, like, a melody is repeated, or um, rhythm pattern is repeated, but all of the way that those patterns in, in, are used in chunks and how the chunks are arranged is the form of the music. And lastly is instrumentation in music, which is uh, determines tone color. Obviously in choir, I don't have instrumentation. I have what's called voicing, but it's the same thing. It deals with tone color. Um, and the fancy music word for tone color is timbre. It's a French word, so it's T-I-M-B-R-E, pronounced timbre. So timbre is timbre, which is tone color. And so every musical instrument has different tone color. And as good listeners, you're going to be able to say, that sounds like it's a clarinet, but that sounds like it's an oboe. Right? Oboe has that kind of ah sound. Clarinet has a mellow yet reedy sound. But they have a slightly different tone color. If you sing something and you sing something, it will sound different because your voices are like fingerprints. We each have our own unique individual sound, right? And that's the tone color. The way I arrange my music. Right? So, you know, some people compose a song and then they turn it over to somebody else who arranges the song. The arranger decides what instruments are going to play together here in this section, what instruments or voices are going to sing together here, and am I going to arrange it so that the tenors are high in the register so it's kind of loud and ah, strangled sounding, or am I going to arrange it so it's low and mellower sounding, right? So, voicing arranging, instrumentation, all those terms have to do with tone color, okay? Um, and that's like the fastest overview I've ever gone. I just want to say, because you mentioned poetry, there is a musical form, it's called strophic form. So, you know, another word for a stanza in poetry is a strophe. And so if I do, Star, or if I do, no, I'll do. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, his fleece was white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went, everywhere that Mary went, it's the lamb was sure to go. It followed her to school one day, school one day, school one day, it followed her to school one day, which was against the rules. It made the children laugh and play, right? Each of those verses is a strophe or a stanza, okay? So that's a very, very common form in music.